Bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, the famous United Church of Christ minister, William Sloan Coffin, once said, I think, therefore I am, nonsense. I love, therefore I am. And speaking of love, whenever I have officiated a wedding and meet the couple to discuss the ceremony, I usually ask what scripture readings they prefer. And often the couple will say something like, what is that passage that's all about love? And of course, you guys got it. They're guessing the one that was just read beautifully by Matt, 1 Corinthians 13. This is one of the most recognized scripture verses in the entire Bible. Love is patient. Love is kind. Perhaps when we hear these words, we think of a young bride in a beautiful white dress walking down the aisle. However, Paul likely did not have a wedding day in mind when he wrote to the Corinthians. Corinth was a city and seaport filled with all kinds of immortality. Immorality. If it was illegal, it was likely being done in Corinth. And since it was a seaport city, maybe we could compare it to New Orleans during Mardi Gras. That's how wild Corinth was in those times. Well, it's in this setting that the Corinthian church was struggling to survive. Believers in this new church were constantly being seduced by the surrounding culture that beckoned them back to living a life of gluttony and excess. Many Corinthian Christians responded to this by becoming legalistic Christians who became really caught up in rules rather than living in the love that God calls us to. Instead, the Corinthian leaders were wrestling for power within the church. Some were making claims to understand all there is to know about God. And that's probably why at the end of 1 Corinthians, we hear those words, we see through a mirror dimly, then we will see face to face. Paul is exhorting to them, no, you do not have all the answers. <clears throat> we only see in part. Others thought that they were superior because they were able to speak in tongues, and others tried to show off their spiritual gifts. Paul's words may have stopped the Corinthian church in their tracks as they read them and realized where they had fallen short. But how about us? Do they stop us in our tracks too if we do a little self-examination? Are we always patient and kind? Ask my husband, and he'll tell you, I'm not. <laughs> I may have the title clergy, but I'm just as human as the rest of you. Can we say that we are not prideful, rude, self-seeking, or easily angered? Do we keep no record of wrong? Let's focus for a little bit on Paul's challenge not to be easily angered and to keep no record of wrong. When we are wronged, it is quite hard to forgive or to not feel angry. It is important to remember that this text does not say that there is never a time to be angry or mad. Instead, what it says is don't be easily angered. Don't be a person who always reacts with anger. Don't be a bitter, resentful person. And don't keep records of wrong. In my work as a therapist, I meet with clients who share with me that forgiving others is something they have not learned how to do. I hear this over and over again. When people ask me, well, how do I forgive? I often share with them that forgiveness <clears throat> is a process that does not happen overnight. And in some situations, and certainly for me in my life, I feel like it's a lifelong journey. It's not necessarily something that happens instantaneously. It can. Some people can have that miraculous moment where all of a sudden their load is lightened. And I've certainly had something like that happen once in my life. But most of the time, forgiveness is something I have to keep working at. This is a journey. 
But also what I tell them is that forgiveness is much easier for me if I try to put myself in other people's shoes. If I try to remember to actively pray for the person who has hurt me, because where there is compassion, it is hard to find anger. And when we remember the gifts and graces that a person has, it's easier to forgive them. When we are mindful of the trauma and the pain that somebody is acting out of, it is easier to forgive. When we're able to maybe wish the best for the person and surround them with God's light and love and bless them, I know that's hard, but when we do that and when we practice that, it's easier to forgive the person who has offended us. In my own life, empathy is probably the most important virtue for me that helps move me towards forgiveness. For example, during my childhood, which I've talked a lot about in various sermons that I've preached, my parents were really loving parents. They were good at loving us. They were good at being proud of us, but they made mistakes. And in order to practice empathy for my dad's alcoholism and my mom's codependency, I had to imagine how that was a result of their childhoods. For example, if I imagine that my dad lost his dad when he was just a young teenager of cancer, and if I imagine that my mom had her dad walk out of the house when she was only three years old because of a gambling addiction, I was able to realize they were doing the best that they could at parents. And in a lot of ways, they did a really good job as parents. But I still had to imagine that the mistakes they made must have been a result of being raised by one parent. And that one parent at times must have been very emotionally absent because of their own grief. So like all parents, my parents carried this childhood trauma inside of them. And this informed the way that they parented me. And knowing this helps me to give them grace for the mistakes that they did make. Although I want to say they really were great parents overall. But yeah, I'm going to make mistakes too. And that's just part of being a parent. So to change the subject, but we're still on this grace and forgiveness bit, but I still want to change the subject just a little bit because we've lost two important people in the world in the last month. And one of those is Desmond Tutu. The other one is Thich Nhat Hanh. And I'm gonna talk about both of them in this sermon. But about 20 years ago, I actually was fortunate enough to get to meet Desmond Tutu. And he was the 1984 um, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And he died December the 26th of last month. So the reason I got to meet him was kind of a coincidence. He was teaching at Emory and I was touring the campus and I got to sit in on an hour class and hear him lecture. And then at the end of the class, I went to thank him for it. And he lit up like a Christmas tree, greeted me like I was somebody he'd known his entire life. He emanated love and light. He was short. He's a shorter man. And, it, and love just effused throughout his body. It was, it was just a beautiful moment. He had a very contagious smile as well. But Desmond Tutu grew up in South Africa under laws that segregated people according to their race. Schools, homes, and jobs were separated, making life much more difficult for those who weren't white. When he was a young boy and was out walking with his mother, Desmond was surprised when a white priest took off his hat as a sign of respect for his mother, a black woman. That sign of love and respect had a lasting impact. It gave him a glimpse of what the world might look like without apartheid, a world where people treated one another as equals. What if following the example of Jesus's love as that priest had done could dismantle institutionalized inequality and racism. That is what Tutu wondered. A little over 30 years ago, apartheid came to an end in South Africa. The word apartheid means apartness. Apartheid was a system for keeping white people in South Africa separate from everyone else who wasn't white. Remarkably, 
apartheid's end was not followed by vengeance, taking on those who had defended and maintained it. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was among the Black leaders who opted for reconciliation with the supporters of apartheid instead of pursuing retribution. Desmond Tutu once said, God's love is for us and our love for others is the single greatest motivating force in the world. And this love and the good it creates will always triumph over hatred and evil. But if you are to be true partners with God in the transfiguration of God's world and help bring triumph of love over hatred, of good over evil, you must begin by understanding as much as God loves you, God equally loves your enemies. I also think it is important to say that forgiveness does not always equate to reconciliation, even though Tutu advocated for that. Obviously, it is wonderful when reconciliation is possible, but sometimes when emotional, physical, or sexual abuse has happened, that may not be the best option. But even if reconciliation is not possible, forgiveness might be. And so how do we move towards forgiveness? Perhaps we start this forgiveness work by asking this question, who is it hardest for you to love? Who is it hardest for me to love? This may be a family member, a colleague, a church member, a political group, a politician, or a religious group. So again, I invite you to ask yourself this question, who is it hardest for me to love? The primary language of the New Testament was Greek. And when we go back to the Greek in our text today, we find that the word we translate into English as love is the Greek word agape. Agape is considered the highest form of love. Agape is the love that we are called to share with others. When we are looking at the meaning of the Greek word agape, it can be translated as intense feelings of affection, attachment, connectedness, sacrificial love, and most importantly, agape is, is used as a verb. So I want you to hear that part. Agape is used as a verb in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. So to have this type of love means that we are called not to be a divided community, but a community, and here's the key word, that actively seeks to live in a connected and affectionate way with one another and the world around us. And we all know we live in such a polarized world right now, and we desperately need this type of love. So what resentments are you holding on to? Perhaps you have a former boss who you have anger towards. Perhaps you have a family member who has hurt you. Maybe there is a parent who has failed to be the parent that you needed them to be. Maybe there is a church member who has let you down. Maybe a spouse or an ex or a friend has hurt you. In addition, again, to losing Desmond Tutu, as I said earlier, We've lost Thich Nhat Hanh in the last eight days. I believe it was eight days ago that he died at the age of 95 and Desmond Tutu died at the age of 90. And Thich Nhat Hanh once said, forgiveness will not be possible unless compassion is born in your heart. In the early 60s, his practice of engaged Buddhism led him to create the School for Youth and Social Services to provide housing, education, and medical care for victims of war in his native home of Vietnam. In 1966, Thich Nhat Hanh visited the United States and Europe on a peace mission, and he was forbidden to return home to live in Vietnam for over 40 years. So just like the Dalai Lama was exiled from Tibet, he became an exile from Vietnam and lived in many other countries during his lifetime, and he was able to finally come back to Vietnam, and that is where he died about eight days ago. But in 1967, Martin Luther King Jr. nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize, and he said, I do not know of anyone more worthy of the Nobel Peace Prize than this gentle monk from Vietnam 
I would highly recommend if you haven't read it to, re to read Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh. There's so many good ones, The Art of Living. I mean, he wrote probably about a hundred books, um, but read something by Thich Nhat Hanh if you haven't. Many of you probably have. And, and King went on to say, here is an apostle of peace and nonviolence. So Thich Nhat Hanh was kind of like Gandhi was to India, he was to Vietnam. But the Nobel Peace Prize, interestingly enough, was not awarded in 1967. And most people speculate that's likely because of political reasons, um, because of so many differences about the Vietnam War that they did not award um, that in 1967. So even though Desmond Tutu got the Nobel Peace Prize, um, Thich Nhat Hanh did, it, did not. But he said, the moment we understand our enemy, we feel compassion towards him or her, and he or she is no longer our enemy. In order you, for you to understand your enemy, Thich Nhat Hanh recommends we practice the meditation of seeing ourselves as a five-year-old child. If you can't remember being five, and I have a lot of patients who've experienced trauma, who don't even remember any time until they were in sixth grade. So you may not remember back until five years old. Just remember the earliest child you can, whatever age that was, and picture yourself as a young child. This is what Thich Nhat Hanh rec recommends. And then he says, breathing in, take a deep breath in. I see myself as a five-year-old child. Breathing out, find your exhale. I hold that five-year-old child in me with tenderness. Breathing in, I see the five-year-old child in me as fragile, vulnerable, and easily wounded. Breathing out, I feel the wound of that little child in me and use the energy of compassion to hold tenderly the wound of that child. But then Thich Nhat Hanh asks you to continue and picture someone who has hurt you that you want to forgive. Maybe you do this part, maybe you don't. But breathing in, I see my father as a five-year-old. Breathing out, I smile to my father as a five-year-old. Breathing in, I see how as a five-year-old, my father was fragile, vulnerable, and easily wounded. Breathing out, I feel compassion for my father as a five-year-old. So Thich Nhat Hanh says that when you are capable of visualizing whoever has wounded you as a child, fragile, tender, and full of wounds, you begin to understand and feel compassion. It's that empathy that we talked about earlier. When we are capable of practicing understanding and compassion for ourselves and others, compassion is born in our hearts and forgiveness is possible. In Forgive for Good, a proven prescription for health and, and happiness, psychologist Fred Luskin writes, in careful scientific studies, forgiveness training has been shown to reduce depression, increase hopefulness, decrease anger, improve spiritual connection, and increase emotional self-confidence. So the task of letting go of records of wrong is one that can lead us to be healthier in mind, in body, and in spirit. Following this way of love is something that leads us to be our healthiest self. But ultimately, we don't forgive because science tells us to, right? We forgive because God calls us to live in this kind of agape love. And so I invite you to join me in living in the example set by the Apostle Paul, by Desmond Tutu, and Thich Nhat Hanh and recommit yourself to living in radical grace, love, and forgiveness. I know during these polarized times, I have to keep recommitting it, myself to it because there are family members in my life who think radically different than I do. And in order to stay in communion with these friends and family members and acquaintances and colleagues who think differently than we do, we're gonna have to be intentional about this. We're going to have to keep recommitting ourselves to this way of love, to abiding in love more than anything else. So let's come back to that question. What record of, of wrong do you need to let go of? Who needs to receive grace from you?
and now abide in these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen.